Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The goal of Voices is to highlight the experiences of leaders confronting major public health frontiers and to better understand effective leadership and how it can affect change. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon and welcome to our audience here in the studio and to our viewers online around the globe. I'm Eric Anderson, the Director of Voices in Leadership. This series focuses on the lessons of effective leadership to create positive change in public health. This event takes place in the Leadership Studio, where the programs and related content have received over 4 million views to date and counting. Today, we host a discussion on leading by preparing for a changing world with Professor Gina McCarthy and Governor Jack Markell. Jack Markell served two terms as Delaware's governor, completing his tenure in 2017. During his time in office, Delaware's job growth was the best in the region and one of the best in the country. The state also reduced dirty air emissions faster than any other state, serving as a national model for improving the environment through efforts that also boost the economy. Under his leadership, Delaware won the top spot in President Obama's Race to the Top competition, and high school graduation rates saw some of the best increases in the country. Markell served as chair of both the National Governors Association and the Democratic Governors Association, and as president of the Council of State Governments. He also served for 10 years as Delaware State Treasurer. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, Professor Gina McCarthy, please join me as we welcome Governor Jack Markell to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Governor Markell, it's great to have you here, and I'm honored to spend a little bit more time with you. It's great. It's awesome. So I wanted to start um, not by talking about a routine thing, but I know you came here to make a big announcement. We had Governor Inslee, Governor Hickenlooper. Go for it. Well, I, I, I do have a big announcement. I had so much respect for you when we worked together when you were head of the EPA that I am the charter member of the Gina McCarthy for president. There you oh. go. There you go. That's so. not exactly what I had yeah, in mind, but it's go. a good answer. Oh, good yeah. answer. Damn, I can never get you, can I? <laughs> uh, but, but uh, Governor, I, d I don't know if everybody knows this, but um, you know, you really came from a, a business background, and I found it really interesting as as Governor of Delaware, and, and prior to that as Treasurer, you really made the transition into political life more smoothly than most do. You understood the societal issues you needed to deal with, and you had this sort of idea that every governor shouldn't just manage a state, but should do it in the context of a changing world. What do you mean by that? Well, I just I do think it's very important that everybody who's in an executive leadership position uh, in government have a very clear view of how the world around us is changing and what those changes mean uh, for the people we serve and what we need to do differently as a result. And for me, I mean, there are just two massive forces at work on our economy, one globalization, uh, which means employers can hire from all over the world. Uh, and the other is automation, uh, which mm -hmm. means, you know, more and more jobs are being affected by the fact that, uh, that computers and software uh, can do things that people used to have to do. And those are incredibly important factors uh, that have really huge consequences for all of the people of my state, all the people throughout the country. And I just, I, I felt it was very important to have a perspective and to use that perspective in making decisions when I governed. And also, by the way, to communicate that perspective to the people I served. And I think what I found is people may disagree from time to time, or frankly often, with decisions that I made. Uh, but if I explain myself to them, and I said I was making these decisions because of these changes going on in the world economy, they would at least give me the benefit of the doubt. And uh, so in my case, it was really about investing massively in skills and also trying to connect more effectively uh, with the world around us. Well, you know, I'm, I'm interested in pursuing that a little bit more because I know that most people feel like that's the purview of the federal government to think about big things in the world. But 
lots can happen at state levels to actually build a foundation for a stronger economy. I didn't. I don't think too many people think that uh, people at the federal level are thinking big thoughts about the world these days. All right. But <laughs> it, it, maybe maybe it's their purview. But, uh, <laughs> um, but you will find probably 50 governors of uh, of you know of, of both parties or any independents th say that uh, we are not going to wait for the federal government to act on virtually anything uh, that we do and that we have to seize the opportunities ourselves. Well, I mean, one of the things that, that you sort of made it a hallmark of, of what you did, not just in Delaware, but when you were chair of NGA, was to look at sort of the societal needs that we were facing, issues that are really important to, to the Harvard School of Public Health in a way that you looked at them as real economic opportunities to address needs of, of individuals in, in a way that would um, uh, address the societal problem, but also grow jobs and get people active. And I'm thinking of three things in, in particular. You had a big focus on unintended pregnancies, and you challenged the healthcare sector to think differently about it and to act differently, and you're still active in that area. And then you did, did work on, on uh, uh, criminal justice reform, which has attracted a lot of, of interest. And, and uh, the, the third thing was, what was it? Employment of people. Yeah, actually, right. yeah, the work you did with NGA yeah. on employment of, of people with, with disabilities. Those are three things that as a, as a governor you saw as, as really important opportunities, but as a business person, you also saw it the same way. Right. Explain to me why those three things, and, and give me a little bit more insight sure. into how you're pushing the healthcare sector. Yeah, okay. In uh, a nasty and, way. No, I'm uh, gonna get <laughs> <laughs> And there were others, but I think these three are all very interesting. So let me start with the issue of the, uh, the unintended pregnancy. Yeah. So, the, so the rate of unintended pregnancy in our country uh, is about 50%. Now think about that for a second. And this is not an issue I ever really thought about before. But when I came to realize that what so often happens when a woman uh, delivers a baby as a result of a pregnancy that was not intended at the time of conception, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes she has to drop out of school or drop out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the, the, the father may have to drop out of school. And oftentimes it's a difficult start for the baby, sometimes so difficult it's really challenging to you know to get back on track and so for me when I when I thought about that uh, and it was really brought to my attention by um, Mark Edwards who runs an uh, organization oh. called Upstream USA he used to run Opportunity Nation yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. fantastic guy and he came to see me and he said you know he had worked as I did as governor but he had worked on every issue from early childhood education to criminal justice reform uh, to vocational education and everything in between and he had come to the conclusion that the most important thing we could do to help all people achieve their potential was really imp to empower women to have their babies when they were ready for them. And so what happens, the typical woman, I know this is not a conversation people ever expect me to be uh, leading. I was going to say, you're yeah. not really the voice for typical women, <laughs> but it's okay, continue. Um, no, no, I'm not. But the typical, if a woman is on the pill for 10 years, she has a 61% chance of getting pregnant because of a lack of compliance. Okay. And it turns out that there are more okay. effective methods. And this is, you know, favored by the uh, American Council of, of Gynecologists, by the CDC, and that's the, the long-acting reversible contraceptives, uh, the, the implant and the IUD. And the more I learned about this, I said, we have got to do something in Delaware to reduce the rate of unintended pregnancy because this is one of the best opportunities we will have to help all people actually achieve their potential and to go as far as they want to go. And so we uh, really, when you talk about challenging the healthcare system, we changed the healthcare system over the last several years so that when a, a woman of childbearing age has an interaction with the healthcare system, she is now asked whether she intends to get pregnant in the next year. And if the answer is yes, then she's connected with the appropriate preconception and prenatal care. And if the answer is no, she's made aware of the full range of methods. And we have trained our health providers throughout the state, not only how to place these uh, devices, but we've, we've trained the coders, the billers, the schedulers in the office. We've changed policies. It used to be one, a, a very good time to ask a woman, 
whether she intends to have a baby in the next year is when she's in the hospital delivering a baby. And oftentimes she would like to wait for purposes of uh, birth spacing and, and other purposes. But historically, if she has said, no, I don't want to have a baby next year, she's been told that she has to come back in in two or four or six weeks. Because Having had three children, that was the last question I was thinking about I'm, the I'm, next I'm, day. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, That's I'm, a good point. And, but yeah. what's, what's, what's happened is because they're told to come back in two or four or six weeks, oftentimes they don't come back because they're so overwhelmed. Yeah. And they end up pregnant instead. And the reason that, that they were told to come back in two or four or six weeks is because the reimbursement policies did not allow the physician or the hospital to be reimbursed for a postpartum uh, placement of a long-acting reversible contraceptive. So we changed that policy. And so what we've seen is a huge increase in postpartum uh, placements. And so literally within the first three years, we've seen a 24% a reduction uh, in unintended pregnancy. I mean, it's massive compared to a 3% reduction across the country at the same time. We're seeing a similar decrease in, in abortion, and we expect that to uh, continue to increase. So it's really, an, it's been an amazing thing to see. And what's really exciting, you know, they talk a lot about states being the laboratories of democracy. Yeah. So now Washington State has committed to do this. It's happening right here in Massachusetts, and it's happening in North Carolina. Those are the next three states. And so, you know, it's when something is working well in the state, other states will oh. follow. So how did you, how did you come to focus on this issue? I mean, it couldn't have just been one conversation. And how did you ever roll this out? How did well, you, I find, you know, because part of the challenge that we have is not to just identify, you know, the, uh, the, where, where the hangups are, but how did this turn into an opportunity for you? Yeah, so uh, to me, the, and, and by, I mean, because there are th really three uh, big benefits here. One is the opportunity benefit that I talked about. The other is birth outcome, because yeah. if a woman, has a baby as a result of unintended pregnancy, it's less likely she's doing the appropriate, uh, taking the appropriate prenatal care. Huh. Um, and then there's also a, you know, some, some savings down the road. I mean, a med every Medicaid birth, a healthy Medicaid birth in Delaware is about $12,000. And we know a lot of these births are not healthy, so much yeah. more, much more ex expensive. But for me, the real hook was around opportunity. That's why I ran for office in the first place. I mean, I think it's why most people run. I mean, the reason that you, know, you, you, you seek public office is because you want to do everything you can to help more people go as far as they possibly can. And when I, became, when I started to understand the linkages between this issue and opportunity, it really got me hooked. And so we, we brought in Upstream, which is based right here in, in Boston as well as in Oakland, California. And they are really expert about how to put this the training together, we put together a, a public facing awareness campaign. Um, and so they were incredibly helpful. And then the question was, well, how are we gonna roll this out? And I was at first, I was, I was concerned about pushback, but I decided yeah. that I was actually going to talk about this in my state of the state speech, which is the biggest opportunity that any governor has to talk about something that's important to them. And so I have to admit only 50% only of the reason was for the sheer joy of watching the legislators want to slide under their seats <laughs> as, as I talked about IUDs and implants from the, uh, uh, from the governor's podium. That's a but, lot of young women to speak to, yeah. I'm sure. But we, actually, but we brought together all the stakeholders, all the health care providers and, and, and others, and it really went extremely well because people understood the huh. connections between uh, this issue, and we were very fortunate to have such a, uh, a, su a supportive group of players within our state. How'd you get the healthcare sector to buy in? They get it. I mean, they just get it, and they they un they really understand uh, you know all of these issues, the opportunity issues, the role that they could play. Particularly when we explain some of the systemic uh, hurdles, like the one I mentioned about pr yeah. postpartum yeah. placements. I mean, they they fortunately get it. I mean, the, you know, these healthcare providers are in it for the all you know the right reasons, which is they want to help they want to help all the people in our state live healthy lives. Uh, and be empowered to make the choices they want to make when they're ready to make them. Is it rolling out successfully in other states at this yeah, point? Yes, so, so Massachusetts uh, has started. They've got a terrific uh, team here, as, and as I mentioned, Washington and North Carolina. So those are the next three, uh, and we expect uh, a bunch of other states to follow. I just find it so interesting that somebody from a business background is, is focused on this. And I love the way you bring the economics into it because I think too often we feel like a health argument is going to win the day. Yeah. You know, we're good and we should do this. And, and it really often doesn't carry the day. 
I mean, it should. It should carry it more often. Yeah. But I think in this case, I mean, we all. I mean, I, I think people really are shocked when they when they hear that fifty percent of uh, pregnancies are That's are surprising. not intended. Yeah. And when they think about the, what the consequences for the, particularly for the women, uh, so often are. Uh, and there are some steps that we can take. And it's obviously totally voluntary. This is for all. We're very clear. This uh, this is for all women. Uh, and uh, I've been thrilled about how well it's gone. Yeah, well, that's terrific because states can make a difference, particularly with the, on health care yeah, issues, yeah. Uh, because they are personal and, and, and you can make change. And that's, in my opinion, where most change happens yeah. is at local and state levels. Oh, for sure. Um, but the, the other thing I wanted to, to ask you about, because I was when I saw that you were actually the chair of the NGA, I know that every chair gets to have their initiative. Right. Right. And so I was looking at the long list of initiatives and yours was a little different than many. I right. mean, it was well defined. Um, it, it had to do with how you uh, basically open up opportunities for work for disabled individuals. Yeah. But uh, but uh, but it was it had a more personal t t undertext to it. If you, you know, it, it was it it was unusual right. compared to, to others. Wh why? Yeah. I mean, where did that come from? So I think that. Two, two things. First, I had an experience uh, when I was uh, early in my tenure as state treasurer, and I visited one of our employers. It used to be the MBNA, it was a credit card bank that was ultimately taken over by Bank of America. And they were a good employer of people with disabilities. And I went to visit one of their locations in Delaware, and they had a unit that made promotional materials. And I met a guy who was 25 years old. He had Down syndrome, he was making t shirts, and he was incredibly excited about this job. So I asked him to tell me about the job, and he did. And then I asked him, I said, what did you do before you got this job? And he told me that he had sat at home for six years watching TV with his parents. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a, think about the profound improvement in his life, because he had a reason to wake up every day and get dressed and to go to work, to earn a paycheck, to be part of a team, to be part of something that was bigger than himself. And I thought about the improvement in the quality of life of his parents because they didn't have to sit at home with him all day watching him watch TV and make unhealthy choices about eating snack foods and, 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 and all these other things. And I thought if I ever have a chance to work at some, on something at the national level, this is what it would be. And then it turns out, once I was elected governor, I tended to have the same sets of conversations every day. Half of the conversations would be with employers who told me that they had jobs to fill, but they couldn't find people to fill them. And then the other half of converse, set of conversations were with people who said, I just want to work and nobody will give me a shot. Some of those were people who had been incarcerated. Yeah. Some were returning veterans. Some were people whose you know, schooling had just not done well by them. And some were people with disabilities. And so I found myself as governor, I mean, really trying to be a broker bringing these parties together. And I just felt really strongly, we have, when you focus on the ability rather than the disability, it's amazing what we can accomplish together. And so when I became chair of the National Governors Association, I decided on this issue and it had the great benefit. You know, there's so much division, so much partisan rancor in our country that this issue, disability, crosses every yeah. boundary every boundary, including Democrats and Republicans. And so it turns out uh, that some of the governors who most uh, enthusiastically embraced this proposal, we had plenty of, plenty of Democrats, but Scott Walker in Wisconsin mentioned it in two State of the State speeches in a row. Terry Branstead uh, in Iowa before he went off to become the ambassador uh, to, to China. And, and so many others. Because we all wanted to be the jobs governor, and what I kept saying was, it's good to be the jobs governor. But let's be the jobs governor for everybody in our state. And so, what, what did you end up? What did you end up doing to advance that? So we we came up. We we spent a lot of time. We had brought a lot of uh, self advocates in, uh, as well as groups representing uh, various uh, disabilities. And what we found uh, a, a number of a number of recommendations that are being implemented across the country. One of them is that very often the state divisions of vocational rehabilitation go to employers and essentially say, can you please do me a favor and find a job for these five people who have a disability? That's one approach. A better mm -hmm. approach is if, the, is if the Department of Labor, which is usually where the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation sits, 
says, you know what, we want to be a partner to our employers and we want to help them find the best possible talent. Now it turns out that talent comes in many different shapes and sizes and many people with different kinds of disabilities have enormous talents. And what we're going to do as a, as a State Department of Labor is we're going to partner with these businesses to help them find the right people. And that was a critically important um, uh, era learning. We also found it was really important for businesses to hear from each other. One of the I went to Tom Harkin, our, our great you know, U.S. Senator from Iowa, who was sort of the number one guy for in the last several decades when it comes mm -hmm. to these disability issues. And I, I, he was so welcoming and so appreciative that we were doing this work. He invited me to a, a, a meeting he was invited to up at um, a Walgreens facility in Connecticut where the CEO of Walgreens had invited in CEOs of a bunch of other big companies. And what he said was, we employ people with disabilities, not out of charity, but because it's the right thing to do for our shareholders. And that was an incredibly important message yes. for, him to, for them to hear, and it was a really important message that only a business person could give. We also found it was important that states walk the walk. It's not, it's not very effective if you say to employers, business, private sector, you ought to be hiring more people with disabilities. But we as states, we're big employers ourselves, and so we had to really take that first step. And finally, we found it's really important that we prepare our young people with disabilities for an expectation of a lifetime of employment rather than an expectation of a lifetime of public support. And so those were some of the most important uh, findings. And, you know, the, the main interest that, that I have in this was just it can be so impactful, not for the individuals or for the companies, but for the families. It's huge. It is I mean, because every parent who yeah. has a child with a disability has to struggle to figure out how to manage that life. I, you know, and I really, I, I did not fully appreciate um, how widespread that is, but I'll tell you, when I, when I decided this was the issue I would focus on, I had many of my political advisors say, you shouldn't do that, you should do education reform or small business or something because those are really the big issues that'll get you national attention. I said, no, I'm good. This is what I really think. This is a, an area where I think we can move the needle. And it turns out, when I went out to talk about it, I would have so many people lined up to tell me their personal stories. Yeah, yeah. and you had a governor do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it, it's, um, it's a terrific honor to you to, to sort of not fall trap to, I can make a name for myself nationally by doing something, yeah. as opposed to doing something for your own state and frankly doing f something for the most vulnerable. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, we had, I mean, Governor Dennis Dugard of South Dakota, for instance, really just embraced this and really mm -hmm. became essentially my co-leader uh, because he, he was raised uh, by two parents who were deaf. And uh, when he shared that story across the country, it just resonated with so many people. Well, part of the issue, I think, in the issues that we struggle with at a school of public health is not just to recognize the challenges and get health care to respond to it, but how do you uh, f develop a social network around that yep. so that individuals can continue to be as, as much as they can be? Know, reach their own individual potential. You've thought about the same thing, and this is something that's gotten a lot of emphasis, frankly bipartisan, is to look at criminal justice reform, which is also a big deal, because I don't think people recognize in the United States we're not doing very well in this area. Do you want to explain some of the work that you've participated in? Because I know you're still active in this. I was seeing an article that you wrote just uh, maybe three or four months ago. Yeah, actually with Governor Dugard, that's in right. fact. Um, so, you know, we lock up as a country a higher percentage of our population than most other countries around the world. We're not any safer as a result, and I think it's becoming pretty well accepted that our criminal justice system is, is fairly, is, is pretty much broken. Uh, that we, you know, we, we, we lock people up, it doesn't make us safer, they're not getting rehabilitated, and we've got to think differently. And so we brought on, uh, fairly early on in my uh, tenure, the, the Vera Institute to help us develop what we call, what, and what they call a justice reinvestment initiative, just to be a whole lot smarter about how we do criminal justice reform. So we found, for example, uh, a very significant portion in our women's prison, it was about 40%, in the men's prison just over 20, um, of those who are incarcerated had not actually been convicted of a crime. They were there as pre-trial detainees. So they had been arrested, 
Can you say that again? Yeah, in our women's prison at the time, it was about 40%, in the men's uh, prison, uh, just over 20% of the people who were incarcerated, they had, not, they had been arrested, but they had not been convicted of a crime. And so um, we looked around the country uh, and said, what, this doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And because certainly those who are a public, a threat to the public ought to be locked up. But there are a whole lot of people yeah, who are locked up who are not a threat to the public. And it wasn't doing them or the rest of society uh, any, any good to keep them there. So we did a number of things. So we gave much better guidance uh, to our magistrate uh, judges. Those are the ones who make the initial decision when somebody is first arrested where to go. I understand, I mean, if you're in their position, the, the safest thing for you to do is to say, okay, we're gonna lock the person up because as long as they're, gonna lo as long as they're locked up, they're not gonna go reoffend, and I'm not gonna be held responsible yeah. for that. But it's not really, it's, it's not a great way of thinking about the system. So we gave them much better guidance, sort of risk assessments. Uh, we borrowed a program from New York, which basically said, you know, identified those who were not a threat to public safety and said, okay, while they're out awaiting trial, let's make sure we connect them to the appropriate services. Let's make sure they show up for all of their appointments. And it's a much better way of going. We did a lot of work on uh, reentry. And so preparing people while they're still in prison to come out. So for so many of those yeah. people, you know, whether it is that they were receiving substance abuse treatment in prison, but then it wasn't available when they came out. They, did, they had no transportation when they got out. They didn't have a place to live. They didn't have job skills. And so historically, all of that had really been the responsibility of our Department of Correction. And we changed that around. I actually put our Secretary of Labor uh, in charge, working with our other wow. cabinet, with, working with our other cabinet secretaries. Then we had a problem. Delaware is a, uh, you know, we have uh, some public transportation, but we're not an urban, um, you know, major market where you have subways and, and everything. And we had a lot of crimes that even if the crime had nothing to do with driving a car, when you got, when you finished serving your sentence, you couldn't get your driver's license. Well, what's that, what's, what <laughs> sense does that make? Because we know that being able to get to work is a pretty good determinant of whether or not you're going to stay out of prison. And so we, huh. so we changed the law so that, uh, and, and it ended up benefiting, you know, thousands of people. Uh, if your crime did not actually involve driving a car, you could get your license back after you had served your time. So simple things like that as well. But, you know, we have a long way to go, uh, you know, in, in our state. We have a long way to go across the country. But fortunately, the conversation is being had. And it's, it's interesting the way that it, it, it's one of the areas where there is bipartisan consensus that change is absolutely essential. There is. I mean, so, for example, I mean, the, the, the Koch brothers um, are... My favorites. Well, really you know, they're, they, they, I, I, they, but they're doing some really great work in this arena. They, they really are. And I think it's so easy, you know, what we often do is we caricature people and we put a label yeah. on them. But when it comes to um, criminal justice reform, uh, they, they invited me a few years ago to New Orleans for a conference to speak on all we were doing criminal justice reform. And it was really, they, they really put it on, but the ACLU had a major role. And I think when you can find issues where you get groups like the Koch brothers to work with the ACLU, yeah, sure. you know that something's going on. <laughs> and, uh, and they really, ha they, they put a spotlight on many of the people that they had uh, worked with who were, you know, given a second chance and who were really making the most of it. Well, let's continue to tout the things where we all work together because yeah. that's actually the way this country supposed is to supposed be. to work. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You know, I know we only have a couple of minutes, but I wanted to not forget to thank you for all the work that you did on clean energy. I know that we've spent some time together at power plants. I always have the most exciting places to, to go to <laughs> with governors. And it was governors. very muddy that day. I don't it know if it was, ever... I remember yeah, that. It was, really it was horrible, yeah, but yeah. it was a great facility. Yeah, it was a great, great facility. facility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I really appreciate it because yeah. we, we made, I think, a lot of progress in that area and, we're go and it's continuing no matter what's happening. Right. It's, it's moving forward. But mostly I want to find out why when you finished your second term, um, you rode off into the sunset on a bicycle. I did. Can you explain for the last minute yeah. why the heck you would go cross country on a bicycle? And did you have a little dog named Toto in the basket? <laughs> it was a bucket list kind of thing for me. And I started in uh, Oregon, did my back wheel in the Pacific in 50 days 
uh, later. I did my front wheel in the Atlantic uh, off the coast of Rehoboth Beach, and it was a great experience that I would absolutely never do again. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So. so that isn't what you would recommend that people do when they uh, leave office, I, I huh? would, uh, it's, a, it's, I'm, I'm really glad I did it, but, yeah. So, so tell me, after completing that, what excites you now? What are the things you really want to do? I think at, being at this the number, point? being the charter member of the Gina McCarthy for President uh, Club you, is pretty exciting. I will exciting. keep you very, very busy. I, I think that's it's very one exciting. vote no, at a time. No, it's um, <laughs> it's great. I mean, I just uh, I, I'm working on a bunch of really interesting uh, issues, and it's I mean. You know, I can't remember who said the, 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 the highest title in our country is that of citizen. I love being governor, uh, but it's great being a former governor as well, and I really enjoy, uh, um, you know, so many of the opportunities I'm working on. Terrific. Well, uh, let me thank you for coming here to the School of Public Health, and um, it's exciting to know that that we have business people who can make the transition and really make a difference in the world. And I, you did a wonderful job in Thank Delaware. You. I think we can all tell from the conversation we've had that you also happen to be a very caring human being. And I hope you stay in the game um, and we'll all continue to work together and hopefully we'll get some more bipartisan efforts on things that matter to all of us. So, thanks. Thank you so much. And for thanks everything. for all you did too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.